so this is the, the mink ranch. The uh, perimeter is demarcated by the uh, aluminum fence. Mink ranching was at one time in the 50s and 60s especially, a very important part of the community's economic well-being. There were, at the height of production, about 25 to 30 ranchers who produced 50,000 pelts a year and marketed them on the world stage through the Hudson Bay Company, which later became the North American Fur Auction. My name is Gay Glowacki, and my roots go all the way back to the first settlers of this area. My paternal grandparents were on the Leicester side and the Atiya side. My mother and father uh, actually met in the beach. My dad was delivering wood to the cottagers in the restricted area, and he delivered wood to a cottage where three pretty ladies happened to be renting that summer, and one of them was my mother. And uh, shortly after, he asked her out on a date to the Moonlight Inn. Then it was history. They got married a few years later. Uh, and amongst that time, my dad had actually started a mink ranch. He was also commercial fishing during that period to, to earn an income. This was in his pre-marriage -mar days. And while he was earning income fishing, he was also building mink pens and sheds and getting established with uh, some breeding stock that was supplied by his mother, Lala Tia. Lala was my grandmother, and she was married to Rex Lester. They were one of the first people uh, to establish a mink ranch, and it was called the Pinecrest Fur Farm. So my dad bought his first piece of property, which is the property that we're sitting on and upon which the ranch was eventually built. He purchased that in the very early 50s with the help of his mother, Lala. Lala was a huge proponent of helping her, her children get established, especially her sons. So making a living back in those days was very much, I would say, an improvisation. There was no straight line to, uh, to a career. You kind of did what you could or you did the work that was available at the time. It took him a while to get established in ranching. You need to have a certain number or volume of, of livestock to make a living. The fur market was very volatile. And so from one year to the next, you really never knew if you were gonna have a good year or a very poor year. Uh, some years he lost a lot of money because he wouldn't make enough to even have paid off the amount he owed to feed the mink. And then the next year it could be a marvelous year where he would make a good profit. There was a time in the 70s where the fur market was quite depressed. And Dad had some other property uh, near Travers Bay. So what he did, and luckily enough, the, uh, the highway was being constructed. Highway 59 was being built through from Winnipeg. And so there was a need for gravel. And luckily, there was a gravel deposit on one of his properties. So he sold gravel for the construction of the highway. And that's what pulled him through for those couple of lean years. If you were to ask me, I'd think Dad's greatest accomplishment was his ability to adapt with all of the changing economic circumstances and being able to source feed in years where sourcing that feed was very competitive or scarce. Um, you know, he, he wasn't afraid to think outside the box or get on the phone and call around to, to find different sources. He's a really good problem solver. When there wasn't enough fish available locally, he started to branch out and gain relationships with fishermen in Saskatchewan. And uh, he got in touch with some very large operations there and they were able to supply him frozen tulipy fish by the semi-trailer load. <laughs> so in the winter time, we would get a delivery of this massive amount of fish uh, where the truck would come and it would dump this huge pile of, of frozen fish in the yard and that 
pile would kind of stay there and he'd whittle away at it as he fed it to the mink, you know, and by springtime he would be having other sources of food that he could uh, tap into. He was a survivor and he was in the business for 63 years. There were some really tough times, but there were some really great times too. And uh, it was a good life and he always, always provided for us. The story would not be complete without mentioning my mother because she was an enormous part of Greenglade Fur Farm. Without mom, we wouldn't have eaten. We wouldn't have had clean clothes, a wonderful home to come home to after we were done a day's work. And my mother also worked on the ranch. She fed mink, she helped us to water the mink. Um, she was our main support system. Uh, throughout the years and a wonderful homemaker. Without her, it wouldn't have come together. When dad got well established, he was raising about 7,000 mink. And during that period, uh, his children, me and my siblings were old enough to be the main workforce on the ranch. He would hire seasonal help when we needed extra help like at the time of, of harvest during the pelting season. A typical day, I would describe a typical summer day, because that's when we were the busiest, would be about a 7 a.m. start. My father was usually up at 5. My father would come out uh, to the feed shed and start to make the day's feed for the animals. That would be a culmination of fish, meat byproducts, vitamins, um, fish oils, that sort of thing that made their coats really healthy. My brother and I would go into the ranch with garden hoses because each pen had its own little water cup so we'd go and you know 7,000 mink means 7,000 little water cups so we'd go and water all these mink in the morning. It would take about an hour and a half to get that done and by the time we were done dad would have the feed prepared so we would go up to the mixer with our feed carts, pump the feed in, and then we'd each take our own cart and go out into the ranch and use these very simple kitchen spoon implements to, to dole out the feed one, one mink at a time. So 7,000 mink, 7,000 spoonfuls of feed. So it was a full day. We'd break for lunch. Mom would always have a wonderful lunch uh, made for us, a hot lunch and then we'd come out after lunch. We'd feed till about three or four in the afternoon. Then dad would wash up the equipment and my brother and I would go out and, uh, and water the mink again. Then we'd go into supper and we'd come out around seven o'clock uh, in the evening to water at the end of the day. That was probably my favorite time of day. The sun was starting to set and it's just beautiful. I mean, anyone who comes to Victoria Beach knows and feels just, just how beautiful it is. And you really felt at one with nature when you were out there in the ranch uh, with the animals. It was actually a, it was a tough day, but you felt really rewarded because you'd worked hard and, uh, and you really appreciated when that evening came. So mink ranching could be very difficult at times, especially when the markets were depressed. Throughout the 70s, a lot of ranchers went out of business in the area. It was just, you know, for one, it was a lot of work. So to have to, to you know, really work very hard all year long for very little return could be quite disheartening. So some ranchers chose just to call it quits, uh, move on to other things, and others stayed on. The ones that stayed on um, were, like my father, ones who would produce in high volumes. My dad had 7,000 mink. Another rancher, Leonard David, I believe he had 10,000 mink. There were a handful of ranchers here in the area that ranched on into the 90s. For my dad, he uh, pelted out in 2003. He was uh, 73 years old. 
he uh, mainly did so because he was tired, like he just couldn't keep up with the physical work at that level anymore. You know, he had grandchildren and I think he wanted to stop and smell the roses. He was the last person in the area that went out of the mink business, so we, we kind of call him the last, last man standing. The ranch was uh, not only a means to an end in terms of putting food on the table, it was actually so much more than that. It was the opportunity for my mother and father to work with their children, uh, get to know their children. You know, as, as hard as the work was physically, we always maintained a good sense of humor. There would always be something that happened that we could have a good laugh over. We got our grounding for life in that mink ranch. I could say that the ranch may be gone and my father may be gone, but the gifts that he gave us through this business, through this beautiful property that he raised us on is invaluable. And we will take that with us for the rest of our lives.